fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. Several shots were fired as President Kennedy's motorcade passed through downtown Dallas. None of us will ever forget this day, yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. This is just a second, please. <laughs> Welcome to the Hagman Daily Show, weekdays 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And now your hosts, Joe Hagman and John Robertson. Hello and welcome to this Wednesday, June 6, 2018 edition of the Hagman Daily Show. We got a great show lined up for you today, so glad to be here. John is with me, Stephen Menking will be joining us in about 30 minutes, and we got a whole host of issues to talk about, starting with... We're just going to jump right into it. Dennis Rodman. What is Dennis Rodman's involvement in the North Korean summit and future peace plan? Dennis Rodman, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is was a famous basketball player, probably one of the best rebounders uh, in, in the history of the NBA. He played on the famous Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen teams in the 90s that uh, won so many championships. He has been traveling back and forth to North Korea for years now. Pretty much one of the only welcome open one of the only Americans that are welcomed by North Korea with open arms. So the question we're going to address today is is Dennis Rodman a CIA asset? Obviously he's not a CIA agent. Uh we're going to play a clip a video clip here of an analysis from the uh what is this? The Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs uh, by the Eurasia Group President Ian Bremmer. In 2014, he addressed this topic of Dennis Rodman and the possibility that he's working with the CIA, even possibly unbeknownst to Dennis Rodman. But there's no other explanation. And, and we see this over and over again. This is a, you know, pretty much a, a sure thing. The CIA is the same as the media, is the same as Hollywood. It's an interconnected world, and all these people are uh, assets in this whole institution of, of power. From Pamela Anderson and, and Julian Assange, that strange relationship, absolutely, CIA involvement. What about Sean Penn? How many people have are familiar with the story of El Chapo? And after he escaped from prison how he was caught again. How many people know that he was doing an interview or meeting with, with actor Sean Penn? And Sean Penn was working with the CIA, and the CIA had tracking devices, and that's how they were able to catch El Chapo. There's a long history and this incestuous relationship between the CIA, between the media, and Hollywood. They're... they're, they're uh, I don't know how the right word for it. They're interchangeable. They're the same thing. The media promotes the CIA agenda. The Hollywood entertainment and establishment promotes the CIA agenda. And people like Anderson Cooper, just off the top of my head, media personalities who have officially worked with and for the CIA. So we're going to dig into this a little bit, John. And uh, what do you think? I mean, what what possible reason... Is there for Dennis Rodman, of all people, to be involved in a political summit between North Korea and the United States? What other explanation is there? You know, at first, Joe, I thought this is feeling a little bit speculative. Dennis Rodman is a rebellious spirit who has who has been a a sort of fashionista savant and a international uh, kumbaya, as long as everybody loves me more type guy. Interestingly, even though I admire many of his films and I think he's also a very fine actor, my dad can't even watch him. Uh, but Sean Penn, uh, is, is very similar. We, you know, Sean Penn went over to Iraq in the early two thousands 
and participated in a, a human shield effort. I don't know if you recall that, but, uh, but, but the CIA tie-in is so real. And I'm glad we're talking about this today because number one, after we play the clip, we can unpack this, but I have been front and center. I've been present through many years of seeing the rewrites come, come downstairs to the stage from up in production. And they are, they are uh, Intel narrative driven rewrites. So that rearranges our shooting day for the day to a degree. And the other thing I want to mention, Joe, I did find that book and then I'm going to hand it back to you. And that book that uh, I was referencing a moment ago is the CIA in Hollywood by Tricia Jenkins. And that's one of a number of books uh, about this topic. There's, a, there's also uh, the book Spooked uh, by Nick Shu. Spooked, how the CIA manipulates the media and hoodwinks Hollywood. Back to you. Sorry about that. I had the uh, mute button on. But yeah, you, you make some great points, John. And what does the article on the Drudge Report say? There's a few of them up there. Rodman role at North Korea summit. This is from the New York Post, and it talks about his longstanding history of the uh, his relationship with Kim Jong Un. And I'm going to play this this video clip here. This is from a man named Ian Bremer, and the YouTube channel is I believe it's the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. If you just search Ian Bremer. Dennis Rodman, the CIA in North Korea. You will find this video. But let's listen to uh, just a few minutes of this analysis from 2014, from January 29th, 2014. And uh, the Eurasian Group president, Ian Bremmer, believes Dennis Rodman is involved with the CIA. Let's listen to his analysis. What do you see about risks related to North Korea besides more basketball games? Yeah. So I was with a friend of mine today, I'm not going to identify him, um, who over lunch, and I asked him, he's in a position to be intelligent on this, I asked him what he believed the likelihood was that Rodman is talking to the CIA. He said 100%. My view is 80. It's 100% that Rodman is talking to someone who's CIA, but he's not aware of that. that, that that's 100%. The, the question is whether he's actually proactively helping. What I think about Rodman, uh, we have no information on this country. And here's a guy that somehow has managed to get re go regularly in and talk to the leader. Uh, any American that knows anything in intelligence would want him to keep doing that. There's absolutely no question. Not only by himself, but now with other people who might actually be able to say something coherent. That's good. I found it really interesting, just a weird thing. So one of the guys that went with Rodman is this Columbia neuroscience professor. Anyone see that? Right? I found that I haven't had a chance to check this out yet. I have no idea if that guy's crazy or not, right? But I will tell you one thing. There is a group in the CIA, and all they do is try to assess, on the basis of tapes and all the rest, what on the basis of how people look and how they act and everything, whether or not they have actual mental impairments and emotional impairments, right? I want to know why this guy went on that trip. I, I find that interesting, right? It's, it's, you know, and I'm saying these things because we know so little. And this is a place where, yeah, the uncle was executed, and there are now rumors that the aunt... All right, Jong we can sister. stop it there. And, and the, that last sentence he said sums it up perfectly. We know so little. All we know is what we see, and regardless of how the relationship between Dennis Rodman and Kim Jong-un started, I believe now it is solely, I mean, maybe there is uh, some personal friendship that has developed over the time. Over time. But I believe that the uh -huh. purpose of this uh, involvement of Rodman is, is specifically for the, one, uh, comfort for Kim Jong-un, and two, because the CIA is definitely involved and the guy said it best whether rodman knows it or not he is working on behalf of the cia boom now the question for our listeners studio at hagmanreport.com is the chia pet brochachos with leopard head that's where we're at 
Uh, these two guys are a couple of a couple of characters, and I wouldn't be at all surprised, Joe. I mean, this is completely speculative, and I'm being a little bit of a smart aleck, but I wouldn't be surprised if Kim Jong Un is working for the CIA. I mean, that's how oh, yeah. corrupt the Central Intelligence Agency is in that's June of 2018. Point. Consider this. Let's you know you know I always like to roll the clock back a little bit, and I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, Joe, but this may be beneficial to some of our listeners. And uh, this is directly from the CIA, who own the Washington Post via yeah. Jeff Bezos. How's that work for you? Yeah. In the 1970s, Congress investigated intelligence abuses. Time to do it again? Question mark. In the wake of Watergate, dem- now remember, this is from the Washington Post. This this is almost like you could call it CIA Newsletter dot com. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in the wake of Watergate. Democrats won – this is going to kill you, Joe, because it was actually the Dems that, that, that uh, headed this up. In the wake of Watergate, Democrats won large majorities in both houses of Congress in the midterm elections of 1974. One of the first items on the new Congress's agenda was to investigate the intelligence abuses of Richard Nixon and his predecessors. In the Senate, this effort was chaired by Senator Frank Church, Democrat from Idaho, His committee examined the actions of the FBI, CIA, NSA, and other agencies between World War II and the 1970s. I would add parenthetically that at that time, during the church hearings, the the NSA did not even technically exist. Back then, it was no such agency. It was strictly in under the purview of tinfoil helmet kooks and black helicopter crazies. And yet we yeah. have it today in the Washington Post, again, the CIA rag. And, uh, and it's, it goes on to say the results were stunning. Investigators learned that the NSA had been engaging in warrantless surveillance of Americans' international telegrams. I mean, think about an international telegram, how quaint. Uh, and illegally opened traditional mail sent between the United States and communist countries. Oh, yeah, John. And you bring up a great point i have in my hands right here a book by zbigniew brzezinski titled totalitarian dictatorship and autocracy and in this book i gotta find it it talks about the control of information and it talks about how in the uh, the, the u.s postal service was the least secure method of communications because they would intercept and read everything that was sent and i'm gonna have to find it here uh but what it, it talks about is uh exactly what we what we have been, uh, the propaganda and terror and it, and it talks about this of how we have been surveilled since the pretty much the very beginning you made the point that the nsa you know didn't exist in its uh you know in, in the current uh term and definition that yeah only in today. the world of bill cooper back but then. yeah and- it yeah. has always existed, and it Portions. will continue to exist, and it monitors and surveils ev- absolutely every single thing we do, and it is, uh, you know, a- absolutely revolting to see the level of power and control these people have. But back to the CIA, real quick. There's a great piece from uh, Medium. Documents expose how Hollywood promotes war on behalf of Pentagon, CIA, and NSA. And it goes on to say the following. When we first looked at the relationship between politics, film, and television at the turn of the 21st century, we accepted the consensus opinion that a small office at the Pentagon had, on request, assisted the production of around 200 movies throughout the history of the modern media with minimal input on scripts. How ignorant we were. We have recently acquired 4,000 new pages of documents from the Pentagon and CIA through the Freedom of Information Act, these documents were the final nail in the coffin. For the first time, these documents demonstrate that the U.S. government has worked behind the scenes on over 800 major movies and thousands of TV shows, implementing its agenda as part of the, uh, uh, I guess, incestuous relationship with the, uh, you know, the CIA. They use Hollywood to promote their agendas, and it's never been more obvious than it is today with the homosexual agenda. You have 3% of the population who identify as homosexual or queer or trans or whatever they want to call themselves today, yet we are bombarded with content appealing to only those specific uh, uh, demands of that 3% of the people. It is absolutely unreasonable to, to the level of indoctrination and propaganda that is 
uh, that we are we subject ourselves to by viewing this content. And we could talk about this for you know a whole week of shows. The CIA, the deep state, control the U.S. media. They control Hollywood, and they control the agenda. And it is all part of a bigger plan to deceive the human race. It, it is about power uh, at its core and, and deception. These people, what do they want? What, what is the ultimate objective of evil? It is okay. to steal the souls of mankind. And unfortunately, because of where we are today as a society, most people don't even believe in God. And, and it's so messed up to see how far we have come, at, especially in this country where America, at least in the idea, at least in the uh, conception of what the, the, our Constitution and Republic gives us, it was probably the only true system of self-government that could be righteous, that could be uh, uh, used for good. But because of the sinful nature of man, everything that man sets out to accomplish is corrupted. And we see that this is, America is no different. They have created a system of centralized power, and they're going to use that power ultimately to enslave all of us. Yep. You know, uh, Joe, there's, I'm going to just tell a quick story, and I've never shared this uh, publicly, at least to the best of my knowledge, I haven't. In 2003, I did a I production designed my first uh, production design gig, and the production designer is, sits, at, sits at the top of the entire atmosphere of the film. It's the production designer who runs the art director and budgets everything to do with the sets, construction, special effects, you name it. So I got a, so this was a very important job, but on a very small picture. And the, and I was looking for a gig right after that. And I was feeling very confident because I just came off this huge, this huge professional challenge. And I went to an interview in uh, North Hollywood for a, 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 what they call a TBD project. Okay. And that means to be determined. So that, that always leaves you scratching your head. You're basically going to interview for a job and you don't really know what the job is. You just know that it's in your uh, professional capability and it's a paycheck. As I'm sitting there in this interview, uh, and for some reason I wore a shirt and tie that day, which you normally don't do in Hollywood, uh, to go, to go get a job for the positions I worked. So it was a, it was a onset prop job. So I would be the, the number two prop, the, uh, the assistant prop, um, property master. And in the middle of the interview, okay. So I was clearly being interviewed by Hollywood guys. We were speaking the same language. We were, uh, bantering back and forth about previous projects we'd worked on. And, uh, do we have any similar acquaintances? That's basically how every meeting in Hollywood opens up. You want to get a feel for who you're talking to. And the best way to do so is by starting to throw out shows names, restaurants, get some bearing of who you're talking to. Long story short, midway through the interview, a couple of new gentlemen joined the interview, Joe, and they were clearly not Hollywood people. They came off like very starched collar corporate America types. And they begin to ask me some really uncomfortable questions about uh, about drug history and family history. And I actually stopped the meeting about maybe 30, 40 minutes in. And I said, I I'm sorry, gentlemen, we need to clarify something. I, I'm under the assumption that I'm, uh, this is about a, a onset assistant prop master gig. Why are we, what's, why, what's with the third degree? Well, it turns out, Joe, that had I got this job, I would have been working in tandem with an actual CIA uh, agent on set. The, the series of videos were going to be shot at one of the private back lots up in Newhall, uh, north of Santa Clarita, and it was going to be CIA lessons learned as we went into the war in Iraq. And the reason they were going to have a CIA agent with me is because my job, instead of being a competent, fully comprehensive onset prop guy, my job was going to be to basically take locked containers from the, from the prop truck to set. And then, and these containers have those kind of tags on them where if you cut the tag, the tag changes color. So you know that the container's been compromised. These these were these were um, uh, uh, status one secured uh, pieces of, of property. Well, uh, so this was going to be Hollywood working with the CIA to to create what they call lessons learned videos that they then show to people that they're about to go send into the field. And this was in 
uh, I want to say March or April of 2003, I interviewed for this position. Anyway, uh, I went to San Francisco for a couple days off and I called this production company because I hadn't heard from them. And I said, uh, uh, you know, what's going on? Are we starting the gig at the end of next week? I need to get my calendar adjusted, et cetera. And I'll never forget this. Uh, they told me that they were sorry. As far as they were concerned, I was more than qualified to work this uh, series of videos, Joe. However, I didn't pass the background check. So, and, and I had, you know, I hadn't been in trouble as a, as a, an adult, but I had some trouble as a minor and, and yeah. apparently they did a deep background on me and, and they felt that I was not per someone they were comfortable having, uh, be essentially a mule, just a, a, a body of two pairs of hand, a pair of hands to move crates of whatever. Uh, so props are going to be something you hold in your hand basically. So this is probably going to be weapon systems or communication systems that they would be implementing on set. So that the idea was it's Hollywood combined with the CIA to make training videos for agents that they're going to insert. At that time, it would have been into either Iraq or Afghanistan. And, and whereas I'm by no means some kind of professional criminal, I couldn't pass the background check. So that's kind of the flip side, Joe, of how CIA and the Hollywood are and, – and the Hollywood – CIA and Hollywood are so intrinsically connected that you cannot separate the two. And the last thing I want to add about that is <clears throat> when Hollywood big A-list actors and actresses need protection, the two places they go first are the agency or Israeli Mossad. I cannot tell you how many bodyguards, quote unquote, I met throughout the years who were either uh, Israeli Defense Force and then Mossad or they were ex-special uh, forces guys and many, many of whom had gone – uh, through the agency. Now, why do I say any of that? Because that indicates clearly that when, and so I remember Jennifer Gardner on Alias, her bodyguards by season three, she was so famous that she needed bodyguards, you know, full arm protection 24 seven. These guys were all Mossad. Well, Joe, how is Jennifer Gardner's agent or manager or the executive producer of Alias going to get Mossad guys if they don't already have those connections in place. Yeah. And I found the chapter where I was referring to Zbigniew Brzezinski over the, the uh, topic of uh, control of communication. And he says a few things and I'm, I'm going to read, uh, just take a few minutes and read this one. He says in a totalitarian dictatorship, virtually all propaganda is directed ultimately to the maintenance of power in the party controlling it. And it says this about the mass communications. It says, uh, in totalitarian dictatorships, all of the means of communication are centrally controlled by the government, regardless of whether they are also actually owned by the government, as in the Soviet Union, or continue under private ownership, as in fascist countries. Hence, they are not available for the expression of criticism or even adverse comment. This monopoly of the channels of mass communication is reinforced by the control of the means of private communication, the postal services, and more especially, the telephone and telegraph. Wiretapping is a common practice, and there is, of course, no such thing as privacy of the mail. In the interest of combating counter-revolutionary plots, the government has the right to open all mail. What this means is that only the word-of-mouth communication remains for those who wish to carry on opposition beyond the point permitted by the government. And then it goes on uh, to, to make uh, several other uh, interesting points, which all re relate to the inner workings of propaganda and how propaganda is so important to the control of power and, more importantly, specifically, the control of the masses and the control of the people. It is the uh, specific function not only to promote the, the agenda, as the Big New Brzezinski further says in this uh, chapter, Propaganda and Terror, nearly complete control of all means of mass communication gives the totalitarian dictatorship the very great advantage of being able to shift its general line of propaganda rather radically over short periods of time. And it also goes on to, to say that uh, the chief characteristics in a, pop, in a, uh, a totalitarian dictatorship is a deliberate effort to intimidate. Governmental terror seeks to frighten those under its sway into conformity and obedience. 
it is therefore it therefore may create a a uh, measure of consensus and willing cooperation an atmosphere of persuasive anxiety and general sense of insecurity are the subjective uh, containments of such terror the near complete monopoly of mass communication is generally agreed to be one of the most striking characteristics of a totalitarian dictatorship and another one of those is the terror terror reinforces the monopoly of the mass communication and indeed is a good part of all communication totalitarian propaganda and can be understood only within this context and conversely the terror assumes its all-pervading quality because it is spread about throughout the continuous repetition of official propaganda lines this linkage of propaganda and terror distinguishes them from all comparable phenomena in other systems of government very interesting this was written in the uh, 1950s joe you know what that just indicates is all our listeners have to do is go read the words of the people who yeah. in many cases fashioned the tyrannical surveillance grid and control grid <clears throat> pardon me that we're living under today that we're literally building up around us and we're doing so with our own money every time we purchase a tablet a droid an iphone etc joe uh two ideas and then we're going to have uh, steven join us here in a couple of minutes uh two ideas the first is our listeners need to I would I would implore you with all sincerity, do some of the things that Joe and I have done. This is how we got to uh, the level of understanding we're at. And by the way, we're still learning and growing every day. That's one of the most fun things about doing this job. But we talked about Henry Kissinger last night on the Hagman Report, Joe. You just read from Zibanu Brzezinski today. If you read Henry Kissinger, Zibanu Brzezinski, Carol Quigley, and uh, Saul Alinsky, those are, those are foundational starting points. Those are like the Rosetta Stones. They're the code breakers that unlock being able to read in between the lines of everything that Joe and I talk about and curate for our program. And I'll tell you what, listeners, if you, uh, so if you familiarize yourself with those four globalist uh, uh, monsters, you will, in short order, have the skill set necessary to do your own program. And really, Joe, that's what we need. We need wildfires lit across the entire country where people, even if they've only got, you know, 100, 200 listeners, if we have, a hundred, you know, if we had 100,000 people with 200 listeners apiece, we'd be literally informing the world overnight. That's number one. Number two, and this will be my final comment for today because, as you know, Joe, I have to peel off and go to a meeting. You know what? It's not – Let's, let's throw self-importance out the window. It's not a meeting, to be honest, listeners. I have to go get a haircut. And it's the only time today that I can do so. <laughs> yeah. And, let's, let's do this, Joe. Uh, let's structure our shows either next week or the following week. Let's tackle one of the projects uh, each day. So we could, we could cover uh, Project Mockingbird, which is what I was just talking about a moment ago uh, with the, the church committee hearings. Uh, we could cover Project Mockingbird, Project MK Ultra, Project Popeye, which is all the geoengineering stuff, and Project Paperclip, which brought all the Nazi uh, 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 monsters over that in many cases initiated all of these subsequent projects in the 50s and 60s that brought us to this globalist tyranny today. Yeah, and and real quick, as you said, go back and read the controllers, what the, what the information they put out, the Zbigniew Brzezinski's, the David Rockefellers, the Henry Kissinger, and in David Rockefeller's own uh, memoirs, he admits that he is part of a, a plan, a larger plan. He says this, some believe we, the Rockefeller family, are part of a secret cabal working against the best interest of the United States characterizing my family and me as internationalist and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic culture. One world, if you will, if that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. He also said yep. this, we are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the bright lights of publicity during those years. But the work is now much more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supernatural sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world banker 
bankers is surely preferable to the national auto determination practiced in past centuries. And it goes on from there. The end goal is everybody to get chipped, to control the whole society, to have the bankers and the elite people control the world. That is from the lips of Nicholas Rockefeller. John, you take off. I know you, you have something you got to go do. And I'm going to bring <laughs> Stephen I've on. got my big meeting. Hey, one last thing before I run, Joe. This is a little little piece of hope for everybody today. Uh, my t- on my Twitter account, which is at Robertson John on Twitter, back on November 24th, Joe, and I, I told you about this when it happened. On November uh, 24th, I found a, a really nicely done graphic of that Rockefeller piece that you just read, the first one. Uh, that starts with some even believe, you know, proof of my family and I, et cetera. And, the, and I tweeted it out, and it says, the Luciferian global elite tell you exactly what they intend to do. So why are 90% of Americans stumbling around dumb as a box of rocks? Now, why do I bring this up? Because I tweeted that out in the afternoon. I laid down to catch about 60, sec- uh, 60 minutes of sleep. It's the only time this has happened since I've been on Twitter. From the time I tweeted it to the time I woke up, which was literally an hour later, it had over 250 retweets, and that never happens off my account, hardly ever. Uh, And to date, it has 1,041 retweets and 1,128 likes. My point is, people are starting to wake up. They're starting to grasp, Joe, what you just read verbatim from David Rockefeller, and it's anecdotal, granted, but even on my, my Twitter feed, you can see that people get it, you know, 250 retweets in one hour. And that is encouraging. That means, Joe, that, that people are starting to absorb what we are uh, working around the clock trying to explain. Absolutely right. And again, what we're talking about, you know, these quotes from uh, the Rockefellers, the Brzezinski's, the globalist, if you will, this is all paving the way. What they're talking about, about the system of accomplishing a world government, of accomplishing this uh, uh, total control total dominations what they've done is they've used uh society they've used our system of government and they have as i said earlier probably in its in the idea of the american government the constitutional republic it is uh, it seems as though it, it's the best system of government allowing the most liberty and freedom uh to mankind but because mankind is corrupt so too is everything that they set out to accomplish and this is no different from our system of government this has been corrupted they use the institutions uh and they use these institutions of power as a means of total control through the economy through the military through education through hollywood everything that we've just been talking about and and not only do these people strive, are they striving for this uh, global one world order system? And, and why is that? Why are they pushing so hard to implement this system? At the same time, why do these, they strive so hard for eternal life outside of God's authority? Why in this collective satanic hive mind is the idea and promotion of human ambition into uh, uh, you know, being able to accomplish the task of living forever, of keeping your body alive, or at least transposing your, your consciousness into some sort of uh, machine in order for you to live forever outside of the authority of God? Why is this their goal? This should tell you everything you need to know about who these people are. Their number one goal is eternal life outside of heaven, eternal life outside of God's authority. That's all you need to know about these people and what they're attempting to do. Not only is it an idea they share amongst themselves, it's an idea that they are implementing or they are, are, are going to force each and every human being uh, to decide, to choose. Are you going to be part of their satanic system? Or are you going to die for your faith? Everything that we see happening in our world, in politics, and in, in everything in the public is designed to push us toward that inevitable outcome. We have with us Stephen Menking. He joined us last night on the Hagman Report, and he joins us here each Wednesday in the second half of the show. Stephen, it's great to have you on. We started talking about Dennis Rodman and uh, him working for the CIA, which is pretty much speculation on our part, but I'd say it's a pretty sure thing, whether he knows it or not, that he is uh, working with the CIA with this whole North Korea situation. But it it took us to the broader context 
of power and control and propaganda and terror and what the uh, globalists are attempting to do and the means by which they they use to accomplish it. So we can go anywhere you want to go. I was just kind of finalizing our our points on that uh, topic of discussion. Well, it's well put by you as always, Joe. And once again, thank you for extending this invitation, this opportunity to join you and your audience here. I had a great time on the flagship broadcast last night, um, and I need to catch up to find Stan's portion as well. Obviously, there's a lot of interesting things going on across the world as it pertains to archaeology and even in terms of the volcanic eruptions and Guatemala and Hawaii and all the rest of it. But Well, Steve, let me ask you this. I I apologize for interrupting, but Stan just got back from Africa. He went to where he believes, what he's been researching for decades, that he found the physical location of the Garden of Eden. Now, since he's been talking about this and since he's left, I've done uh, some research into different theories on the Garden of Eden. Some people think it was a physical place in the world. Some people think it was purely spiritual. Other people think it was a mixture of both. What's your opinion on the Garden of Eden? Do you think there was a physical place on this earth that can be identified today as the previous Garden of Eden? I think that there is uh, a conflict there in terms of the different kind of perspectives. As for me, I think the simplest, most straightforward reading of the scriptural evidence in Genesis is that this was, in fact, a physical place that was here uh, on this earth. Now, if you want to get into some more of the metaphysics of it and the spiritual dynamics of it, I suppose you could say that, uh, and I haven't run into the spiritual only arguments extensively. I suppose you'd have to make the claim that, okay, we don't have specific archaeological uh, evidence that's definitive, as well as, you know, the idea of the connection between uh, God and Adam and Eve before the, before the fall being so close as to point out that that could have taken place in another quote-unquote realm, but I think that in the context of the creation story and um, and the, the creation of the first human beings, the the simplest kind of approach that, that I would take, and I, and I don't see anything immediately otherwise to point me in a different direction, is that Eden was indeed a physical place, albeit on an earth that pre-flood and such a such a long time ago that it would have had different sorts of properties in terms of gravity and uh, continental positioning and and everything else like that and you know when it comes to the nature of the earth that's where you get into a whole host of other controversies with some people saying it is uh, flat other people saying it is hollow other people saying it is expanding and a variety of different models exist of both the earth and the and the universe from a cosmological perspective to try and clarify these things now for me i can with the skill set that i have only kind of look at the uh, at the evidence as as deeply as i can go which isn't to the point of uh, precision in terms of my expertise and so what i'll do uh, joe is if i get into an investigation like that i'll examine i'll examine arguments and then uh, sort of have as my default position the plain language interpretation of uh, of scripture so i'm not exactly sure i don't know whether uh, whether the garden of eden is in uh, what would now be considered um, the the middle east or even in the territory of israel currently or if it was more of a um, a, a garden in Tanzania or other parts in Africa. And I know that uh, Stan is uh, a proponent of the Africa hypothesis and presents um, uh, presents various archaeological evidence that, you know, to me, um, I find I find extremely interesting. But to be honest, I haven't looked into all of that deeply in in a couple of years, and so I'd need to refresh my memory in order to form a solid kind of hypothesis. But in any case, the the way in which I would approach these sorts of things is to start from uh, the basic reading of the scriptural data, because if things don't fit with various right. pieces of the scriptural data, then right. Uh, then that option can be excluded. However, uh, there are different ways of interpreting things that are valid, and then you have to do a more comprehensive analysis of what fits the evidence best. And uh, another 
key thing that I know is that apart from basing things on scripture, the earth uh, looked and was a, com uh, a significantly different place back in the time of creation. That's also in the biblical data. And so uh, for me to pronounce something conclusive on that would be out of, uh, out of place for me, in part because I haven't looked at these things extensively in, uh, in some time. But nonetheless, that's how I would approach questions like that. Well, no, I, I do appreciate the answer. And, and I ask because uh, I don't know. I, I do believe that Standeo believes he has found uh, the physical location of the of the Garden of Eden, and I don't know enough, uh, you know, to to uh, dispute it, to to debate him about it. I, I just don't, I don't have that understanding. But I wanted to get your understanding because I find it fascinating that uh, you know Stan seems so convinced, and he's such a great researcher and, and scientist that it when when he makes a claim like this you have to take a look at it and it's something i'm going to be devoting some time to uh researching whether we you know we really get into it on air or not uh just for my own curiosity just for my own understanding it's something that i'm going to look into so i appreciate your your insight on that but um what do you think dennis rodman uh does he working for the obviously he's working for the CIA there's an incestuous relationship between the media Hollywood and the CIA and we read a piece that that details uh, the Pentagon and the CIA's involvement in in thousands of major movies and TV shows over the years and this is just what has come out through freedom of information request uh, uh, pieces that people have, have put in so we don't even know the full extent of the influence the CIA and national security wields in our society, but I would I would argue that it's far greater than even we understand. But what do you think about Dennis Rodman and him being a part of this whole North Korean uh, summit? Well, it certainly is an interesting piece of the puzzle here and lends a bit of curiosity to it. And even if I can't go so far as to say I have direct evidence that either Dennis Rodman is an asset or anything else like that, it does stand to reason that you don't really just simply go to North Korea in a in a high profile kind of setting like that you don't just get to spend time with uh with their leadership over there on a casual basis and there is um some documentation and uh some more concrete uh speculation that it is actually uh that north korea has been for some time under the control of let's say western intelligence uh agencies but again like we don't have too much that's that's concrete there apart from the conjecture of counterfactuals like there it's hard it's hard to imagine a situation where a private citizen who is in the public in the public view the way that the way that Rodman is uh, just says hey I'm gonna go I'm gonna go over there and have a chat with uh, with Kim Jong-un and uh, and deal with and see what and see what happens and you know far be it from me to get too far out on a limb but the way in which we see the narratives unfolding and the curtain being peeled back on the activities of the intelligence uh, agencies and the entire intelligence community in the western in the western world uh, you know we're seeing things that are totally beyond the pale in terms of making fiction look like child's play in terms of the back and forth and the uh, intelligence and information laundering that took place in the run-up to the 2016 election. And so it certainly wouldn't surprise me to to know that uh, Rodman is in on in on something or operating at the behest or just with some guidance because at the very minimum you would imagine that someone somewhere had to rubber stamp his his activities because if the if the government um, and if the intelligence communities didn't want that to happen then it wouldn't have happened so regardless of where you see the positioning on it you it is important for us to acknowledge the influence and the heavy hand of the intelligence communities in terms of shaping not just geopolitics and uh, information and military strategy, but also the overarching perceptions of the public, because uh, public 
views and opinions and perspectives are actually very important to uh, to foreign policy in particular because it will determine the window of what can get done and what the reactions will be from the population writ large. And so to the extent that that messaging can be controlled and guided and scripted and everything else like that, uh, I like you said, Joe, I think we would be surprised the extent to which there is influence over these sorts of affairs. But again, unfortunately, it's something that I don't have anything concrete uh, on. So that's just my sort of uh, prima facie analysis of uh, of how the situation has played out. Yeah, and and you know, I mean, when we when we look at this, you know, how what what harm is there in someone like Dennis Rodman, you know, maybe working for an, a U.S. government agency and being involved in this process? And if Kim Jong Un trusts Dennis Rodman, obviously they've been friends, developing this relationship over a period of years. I guess really, what harm can it do? But it just should be noted that the CIA is the same thing as Hollywood and Hollywood is the same thing as the CIA and it's the same thing as the mainstream media it's the same thing as the all these institutions of power that have control over mankind that uh, they have the same agenda and as you said Stephen when you came on people have to read the scriptures you have to go back and read the old testament because even prophecies that applied uh, and have already been fulfilled in times of old are applicable today when we talk about the governments the uh, 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 the uh, aspirations of evil being played out through mankind in the systems mankind has created we are in a time that is uh, never before have the conditions been so perfect to implement the one world government, new world order, satanic uh, government system that is going to be implemented. Never before, we've never been closer ever in human history than we are today. And tomorrow we're going to be closer than we are today. And that needs to be taken into consideration. And hopefully people understand the urgency and the necessity as to why they need to read the scriptures today as soon as possible. But that's how you can understand what's going on in the world. That's how you can. That, that's the only thing that makes sense when you look at everything uh, that we see. Because whether it's a, a communist government, uh, you know, with, with a communist socialist government, or whether it's the uh, American system of the the constitutional republic, both of these systems are working towards the same agenda. And I think people need to understand that. And every everything that falls underneath that, you know, politics, sports, entertainment. It's all a distraction from uh, people focusing on that agenda. And as I was reading from Zbigniew Brzezinski's book uh, today, he says the following, that the only uh, option that the people who are against the New World Order have is uh, the rebellion. And and it, it, I got to find it here, but it says that uh, the any relax. OK, here it is. It says the following. It says, since according to their own loudly proclaimed professions their system must be made worldwide those who reject the systems have no alternative but to strive for its destruction any relaxation of the vigilance required to face such ideological imperialist as the totalitarians is likely to result in a disaster such as the second world war or worse and it goes on to talk about uh, the american system of government and how it fits into the larger agenda but don't think for a second that America is an exception. This is the, the driving, it is the driving force. It is the, the bridge that gapped between the dark ages into this technological, uh, you know, new world order system of government. It was America that was the springboard that is accelerating all this. So whatever was a setup for good, if it even was set up for good, is being used for evil and total control. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Stephen. Sure. I think part of the overarching dynamic here is to understand how far things go up the food chain. And depending on who you ask and what time of day it is and yeah. what the last documentary uh, people watched was, you could say, oh, well, it's um, it all goes back to the Masons or the Jesuits or the, the Crowleyans or the Babylonians or the Reptilians. <laughs> or, you know, you could just get into all sorts of different territory. But What's important to note is that we have to be able to trace things back really to the to the root. And so it all goes back to uh, the battle between 
good and evil uh, and this goes through all different ideologies and if we have uh, time at a at a later date then maybe I can take uh, take the audience through a little bit of an analysis that demonstrates how every ideology every system of belief every religious structure everything that is outside of biblical christianity and faith in jesus christ is actually just luciferianism in disguise and by luciferianism i mean the lie that was told in the garden that uh, man will become as god knowing good and evil being able to determine what is right and what is wrong becoming a moral authority uh, unto themselves and to have the control over over creation and so you know whether we're talking about uh, humanism or uh, false false religions or uh, particular cults or uh, even scientism and and secular atheism and, and all of it it basically comes down to the principle that we will determine uh determine these core worldview principles whatever whatever we say uh, goes or that our rationality can capture everything and that there is nothing beyond our our rationality that is that is worth discussing or that is valid and all of these are just manifested reflections of the luciferian lie the the satanic swindle in the garden that we get to determine uh, all of these different parameters from a worldview perspective and all of that goes back to pride and so there are immense levels of uh, good and evil that are that are taking place and as such one of the dichotomies that you also see is the dichotomy between um humility and pride at least in in our in our lives in our societies and you can look to the people who are prideful versus the people who are who are humble um of course being discerning as always to to figure out who is being falsely humble uh or you know who is humble uh seeming because of their pride because that's how they they want to drive value like it's always more complicated than it than it at first appears but it's all just um manifestations and twists and turns of these same kind of themes and so i think that in a time such as this where we're looking at and trying to understand the levels of control that various institutions, individuals, organizations, and ultimately um, spiritual powers and principalities have over various components of our societies and our lives. Uh, let's go to a particular psalm to, to orient ourselves towards the way that uh, God would have us to act. And this is going to be Psalm 139. And this is out of the New King James Version. The idea is to once again be reminded and even overwhelmed by the nature of God's omnipresence, omniscience, and his sovereignty, and then to orient ourselves towards uh, towards those principles and um, how we should position ourselves uh, against the wickedness that we see in our generation. So Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me before and behind and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. And if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light around me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you. But as night shines as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you form my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. And in your book they all were written. The day is fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. 
Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the life everlasting. So, Joe, this is a powerful reminder in a psalm that was just in my, in my devotional today. Uh, the, the five psalms that, that I go through on a daily basis as we w- work our way through the book of psalms once, uh, once every month. And, you know, reading this, I was just reminded and, and overwhelmed by the, this notion, this idea, this truth that God is with us. It doesn't matter uh, where we go. Uh, it doesn't matter what state of state of mind we're in. God is uh, God is with us. He is present, and He is an ever present help in time of need. And this psalm points to the idea that God was with us when we weren't even yet in existence. He is the one who created us. And he is the ultimate authority and the ultimate power, even if prophetically speaking and scripturally speaking for a time, there is control that is given to powers and principalities that is that is allowed. And ultimately, we have to align ourselves with the word and with the will of God. And when we when we look at these uh, at this evil, you can see here in verses 19 through 22, oh that you would slay the wicked, oh God, and you know about hating hating the wicked with with perfect hatred. You know, that's that's extraordinarily strong language. Um, but we are talking about spiritual warfare and we're talking about a a posture that identifies not only God's total power and his presence but also his total holiness sin cannot be in the presence of a perfectly holy God but um, our final instruction from this psalm is for us to reach out to God and turn ourselves over and surrender everything and uh, and confess and really seek God's face that he would search us and know our hearts and cl- and clean everything up because we don't have the strength, the presence of mind, or even the desire to clean up our own house apart from uh, God's Holy Spirit and the conviction that that provides. So we have to accept and adopt responsibility for what we can control. And we did uh, discuss that to some length uh, last night on the flagship broadcast, but just to reiterate it here, here again, God is for us, and it doesn't matter uh, what things look like. It doesn't matter uh, the the composition of the hierarchies that that you can draw. Uh, God will never leave us nor forsake us, and that's a promise from Scripture. But of course, that doesn't absolve us of our duty to stand up, to, to speak out, to educate, to provide people with uh, encouragement and the, the true understanding of what is going on in our age through the, through the lens of Scripture. And these are incredibly important issues, but it's always worth noting that the enemy is prideful and views themselves as having an inflated level of power above and beyond what they actually have. Because the ultimate authority, the ultimate um, point, the name above all names is the name of Jesus Christ. So that's that's something to sort of make sure that we're, we're looking at these things and understanding them, acknowledging them as they are, and then dealing with them through the lens of Scripture. Well, that's uh, very well said, Stephen, and you've taken us right to the end of the show. Folks, if if you can support us, there is a PayPal button. There's a PayPal link in the blog talk description. Uh, Please do so by by donating there. Also, you can support us through supporting our sponsor, simplycleanfoods.net, using promo code SIMPLYCLEAN, which will get you a discount on all your survivable, storable food and accessory needs. With that, we are out of time. Stephen, thank you so much for the tremendous insight and uh, adding the uh, exceptional scriptures that you read, putting the whole show in, into the proper context. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Joe. God bless you guys. Thanks again for having me, and I'll see you next week, God willing. All right. We'll be back tomorrow. Have a great day.
The Hagman Daily Show is brought to you by The Hagman Report. Tune in to The Hagman Report weekdays, 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. For more information, go to HagmanReport.com. That's HagmanReport.com.